All right, Paul, thanks for joining us. Welcome to Grey America Outlawed. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, you're you're recommended from some of our past guests and uh, sort of loving your your work and and looking into it a little bit. So, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of places where we could go, but uh, if there's, you know, if there's some place, I mean, maybe a little bit about your background, I guess, and and kind of how you became a dissident journalist, and then maybe we can get into some specific topics of your of your blogs and your books and stuff. Yeah, well, I was um, I've actually. Um... I was a professional journalist um, for 25 years, but not a you know just a just a local a local journalist of the uh, sort of humdrum kind. But in my spare time, I was a, a dissident journalist, you know, writing anonymous uh, newsletters and stuff, and, uh, hoping that I wouldn't get into, get into any trouble at work for doing that. So, uh, so it's not really new, except that I gave up the day job and just started doing this all the time now. So, when was that? I was ter well. I gave up the job uh, eleven years ago now. Mm. Okay, and and how, how long were you doing the sort of moonlighting as a dissident journalist, like for a while, for a few years, or? Oh yeah, for yeah, right, right, yeah, for um, for years, yeah, pretty pretty much the whole time. You know, I've always been sort of um, involved in um, in sort of um, anti-establishment uh, groups and ideas and so on. So yeah. And so you've always you've always kind of been anti. Are you, have, I, have you always been anti-authority, anti-establishment kind of? Yeah, well, always. I mean, um, yeah, pretty much. I think. Yeah, I mean, my, yeah. I've been pretty consistent over the last thirty years, at least. You know, as to, as to what I, where I'm coming from. And can you summarize that for us? I know you've got some fantastic quotes there. You know that that I could read. But what what would you summarize your you know your your last thirty years like your your sort of view? Well, I've, I've started calling it uh, organic radicalism. I mean, I was—I uh, used to call myself an anarchist, and I sort of still am. But there are so many different types of anarchists out there that uh, you know, I sort of got a bit tired of arguing with with you know transhumanist anarchists and, and things like that about <laughs> who was who were the real type. I mean, this is, so uh, I thought, well, no, let's just 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 call it something different, and then I then I can just leave me alone and let me get on with it. Hopefully, which is not entirely true, unfortunately. So, so it's a sort of um, an anarchism based on the idea that anarch anarchy is the sort of natural way that we should be living, and that, that we've got the sort of innate potential, as Kropotkin and classic anarchists said, in fact, the innate potential to cooperate and uh, practice mutual aid and uh, live the way we want to without central authority uh, trying to mould us into it, its idea of what we should be and what we should be doing. Uh, well, that's the, that's the, that's a, a very brief summary. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, who's who's been a lot of your main influence uh, for that over the, over the years? Oof, I've been a few actually. I mean, um, Kropotkin was one of them, uh, but uh, also um, Herbert Reed was quite important actually. He was um he was a British anarchist, uh, and also people like Rene Guénon. Who was um, yeah. the metaphysician, and because uh, of his critique of the modern world, so I'm sort of bringing in a number of uh, a number of different threads, really, bringing them together, ideas that I can see belong together, but which are not generally regarded as as being part of the same thing. Oh, the situationists, also Guy Debord, and the, you know that 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 sort of tradition as well. So, what are some of these main ideas that you bring together then? For because I I mean I I do love the the way you um, avoid the materialist sort of paradigm, you know, you bring spiritualist spiritual spirituality, I guess you could say, into it, or metaphysics into into anarchy. Um, what are some some of those other ideas that you bring together? Um, well, I suppose from the um, from the situationists like Guy Debord. It's this idea of the uh, of the, the falsification of the world, the idea that everything is becoming more and more artificial. That we're in a sort of ersatz society where we're just, we're being shown we're not being shown reality as it is. And uh, something he said, which I, I particularly like, is that, that even the people that are supposedly uh, the opposition, I think he'd be thinking of the uh, of the left in particular, although they uh, although they use the um, they, they use a language which appears to be uh, 
criticizing the, the system. They remain within it. And even if they speak a different language, they're using the same syntax. So it's that idea that I, I often try to express that we need to really get down to, to seeing the world in a completely different way to the way that the uh, current society tells us to and, and educates us to, <laughs> and, uh, uh, which is, you know, which is going against pretty much all of the uh, the mainstream so-called philosophies or political political movements anyway yeah. um i'm trying to start again with a, a different a different vision of the world uh, but one which is based on tradition ultimately which is which is a traditional way of looking at the world that is something that we had once and that was uh, removed from us thanks to the evolution of uh, modern society well so was there a time when we were more like w what you're talking about yeah, definitely. I mean, um, pre-industrial society, for a start, um, which in America, which of course in America was a lot, uh, a lot more recent than it um, than it was in Europe. But we can't, you know, the people that lived, the indigenous people that lived in uh, on um, Turtle Island, as it's, I know it's sometimes called, though it's you know, uh, did live in a different way. Um, they didn't live in a, an authoritarian state system. I mean, it's not to say that they lived in a perfect way or that everything was just you know, rainbow coloured and happy all the time or whatever, but they, they lived differently. In fact, so Crow Capel, who I know you've had on the show, he's just written a thing about um, the, uh, the, the, the fact that it appears that the news coming to Europe of the way that uh, indigenous people lived in, in, in the Americas helped to create anarchism as a movement because it it broke through that assumption that people had that there was only one way to live which was uh, you know a, a sort of european peasants with a king and feudal system and the rest of it and suddenly it opened up the european imagination so it's not necessarily uh, anarchism isn't necessarily the eurocentric uh, belief system that it's sometimes made out to be it's more going back to, in my mind as well as to crows it's going back to the way that people did once live no matter how many years ago we might calculate that to be and that and that we want to live because which is why we have the idea i certainly have the idea within me that, that the society i find myself in isn't appropriate isn't right and there's something that makes me deeply uneasy about it <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially for the especially over the last three years but even four years nearly now isn't it yeah but even before that in fact but um and also this idea, I think that's that same idea of how we did live once and we would like to live is, uh, you know, obviously forms the idea of a, a dream or a vision of how we would like to live. And it's, it's something to aspire to as well. It's, it's really interesting that uh, they were so wrong about civilization, savages, barbarians, you know, all those categories when, when, the supposed civilized people colonized North America and, and I guess other, other areas around the world too, with the British empire or whatever. And, and it just feels so backwards. Now we're, now we're looking at, like you said, the indigenous people, the so-called savages as actually like more of a, 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 a proper way to live on the land with nature, you know, and, and with meaning yeah. and with purpose and happiness. Like somebody mentioned on our show the other day, like the, the, um, the, in the tribes, like people had, uh, that had their purpose kind of given to them. Like, what are you good at? What are you, what do you, what's your purpose in the tribe? What's your purpose for society? Like what's your, you know, where, which you would get meaning out of. And we just have none of that. Now the young people are full of anxiety. They have no, no positive view of the future, no purpose, no meaning. But the, the part that I'm having a hard time reconciling with, which we talked to Crow about as well. And, and he, I think really did a good job explaining that is, so to me, there's an anti-colonial aspect to my sort of, I think what you're saying and what I'm saying, but there's also this huge anti-colonial pushback from the far left, you know, which is like the, you know, every, so there's a, like in a Venn diagram, like my, you know, my, uh, us would sort of have this spot in the middle with the, the woke leftists about anti-colonialism, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I hesitate and it kind of uh, weirds me out that that we have this common ground in something because you know otherwise um, you know sort of so opposite to to what they're thinking is. Do you have any th thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean there is um, 
I think you'll find some common ground with any with any other set of beliefs. To be honest, I mean, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I've come from the other direction in a way, and I've been surprised to find how much common ground I have with uh, conservative Christians. You know, culturally conservative, anyway, not, and uh, which I wouldn't wouldn't have imagined. You know. 15 years ago when I was hanging around in the local uh, anarchist club back in England and, you know, we were wearing our hoodies and uh, thinking that we all, all agreed with, with each other about everything, which turned out not to be the case at all. So, and uh, yeah, nowadays it's um, yeah, very different, very different to people that I'm finding myself um, aligned with, you know, to the extent that we agree on um, a large amount a large amount of our analysis of, 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 the, of the modern world and what the, a future world might, might look like. That's quite fascinating. Go ahead, Darren. So then how much of that do you think is language? It's like just the, the barrier of language of us not being able to fully explain, you know, we're just like running with the anarchist word instead of ex actually explaining what that means to each person inside of that group, you know, because I tend to think that, you know, there's there's the ultra woke left that's <coughs> probably lost. Yeah, but well, most of them, you know, if you could go spend some time with, you know, and not like a debate, but you just got like stuck on an island with a lefty, you know, I feel like after a couple of weeks, you guys would be getting along and you'd find out that at the end of the day, <coughs> when you really unpacked it far enough, you agreed about more than you disagreed on what the real hang up is is how you get there yeah that might be one of them. yeah that might be one of them but yeah you're right about the uh, the language issue because one of the things i noticed was uh, like being in my little cocoon of um of anarchism in europe it's when we talk about capitalism we mean um we mean what some americans call uh, crony capitalism or you know we mean the the system the the global the wf and the, the black rock and everything like that whereas um you know, use the word uh, in an American context, and people people think, well, you're, you're against uh, private property, or you're against individual rights, or you're a communist. You know, if you're if you're criticizing capitalism, you are on the far left. So I've sort of um, I've, I've been trying not to, you know, well, gradually I'm sort of easing that word out, or I'm qualifying it, and trying to because I don't want it to be a barrier between me. And somebody who also dislikes that system, which I'm calling capitalist, but who calls it something else. And so, yeah, it works in either direction. I think if you were. Um, that's a great example, that one, because that's the that's probably the biggest one. You know, like me and most anti-capitalists have an, a, a, a fundamental. I don't want to say, well, we have a fundamental difference in opinion of what capitalism is. That's what I find with most. I don't know, I'll use socialists for an example, but, you know, they hate what's going on right now, which I hate too, because it's not real capitalism, I would argue. Real capitalism should be like an exchange between me and Graham with zero intermediaries. You know, that intermediary could be the state, that intermediary could be a shareholder. You know, there's different ways of looking at how we fucked it up. But, you know, that, that capitalism is a great example because... You could put 10 people in a room and you'd probably get 10 different defini definitions of what capitalism is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, how, how do you get around that? I suppose you just, you have to speak a different language. We have to find a sort of, you find a common language that we do understand the terms. And perhaps, you know, to have to be a bit creative about the, uh, the way you describe things rather than just repeat the same old uh, slogans that you've always repeated. And, and, and the assumption that people are going to understand what you're talking about. Yeah, like the like we had John Sneezen on recently. He's in sort of a a self taught economist in Canada, and, and he was talking about Millet's speech about the free market, like that capitalism. Which as an he's an anarcho capitalist, so his view of capitalism is complete free market, like Darren was talking about. And the view that most the the capitalism that's thrown around as as such a negative thing seems to me to be more of like fascism. Than, than capitalism. And I mean, I think there would be some real uh, commonalities between like just a pure free market and sort of that sort of anarchy. You know? Yeah. I mean, if you're really, you know, if, if it's something that doesn't involve, uh, doesn't involve the state and doesn't involve uh, powerful uh, 
in go, but you know, intermediaries who are uh, yeah. you know, your monopolies and so on. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't see that there's an immediate contradiction. Though that's not what I would call capitalism. See, in my mind, capitalism is isn't that. Yeah, when you describe it that way, I can see that that is completely compatible with my idea of anarchism. Yeah. What's and the other good one is free trade, right? I mean, it sounds so great on its surface, but it just don't work. It don't work unless you're in free trade's great within America or within Canada or within. I don't know enough about Europe to say if it could be all of Europe, if it has to be the independent countries in Europe. But in order to do free trade, we need to be on the same like. Well, standard either we need standard some, of living. Well, either we need to be on some on the same. Either we need some. Uh, we need some way of leveling the playing field. You need these, some laws that are against the exportation and importation, or you need tariffs, or you can't export, or you can't import. Or you, I don't know how you do it, but you can't do free trade when you've got places in the world that are poor as shit. Because all we've done is turned China and India and Mexico to a lesser extent into into modern day slaves i mean that's really what's going on over there you could you could argue it's not but i mean when you got a half a million people in a factory churning out fucking iphones and you got to put nets around the things because people are jumping off them and you find out that the the whole family's living in this factory and the wife's working and when she gets home the dad goes to work and then you know and the kids just live up in this factory and this is the mm -hmm. fucking life that they're they're growing up and that's that doesn't work i mean if 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 you made the iPhones inside America, then you know, then you're paying that rate. Maybe it works. I don't know how we can start to send things around the world because that was a big part of it. Is as soon as we started offshoring everything, we just I don't know. That's not capitalism though. It's something fucking gross. It is gross. I mean, it's um, yeah, well, it's imperialism, isn't it? Well, that's the whole idea is to, because uh, you know the people in people in America or in Europe, in the West, you know, the workers were asking too much money for, from the point of view of the of the people that wanted to make more profit. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, just all these 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 poor people in another part of the world with a colonial regime that is, uh, you know, it doesn't take any notice of uh, human rights and democracy and all the things that we our ancestors have fought for. And they'd achieved in our societies so they are they've got a nice um a nice uh, greenfield development area somewhere else you know they're just going um go and exploit the people of china or india i mean that was what it always was wasn't it they, uh, under the british empire when i just see that i can see there's just such a clear continuation between the, the british empire and globalization now and it's the same thing it's just you know it's headquarters switched to to, to Wall Street, perhaps at a certain moment, and is now going to perhaps be switched over to uh, Beijing or somewhere. But it's it's the same it's the same entity that is just exploiting people. It's not real. I mean, I'm that's the main takeaway I get. The others guys, we never left that feudal system. I mean, they just came up with a way to keep the slaves from revolting constantly. Mm. That's what it seems yeah. like to me, because uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe the tech thing has started to upset that a little bit, but, you know, this, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist, which is what, you know, this empire, whatever empire we're in now, it ain't being fucking led by people that we elect, clearly. Oh, I well, know. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. So how, go, go ahead, Darren. Well, it's like... It's like when you come up, even at the end of World War II, where you know the Nazis supposedly lose the war, but then they come up with three or four of the most powerful corporations in the world right after that. I mean, that to me is just the kind of that same example of okay, you took some regime out, but something's still going on there, right? Okay, sure, maybe Hitler's gone, maybe he's not. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that conversation right now, but clearly there's some. You know, you got, uh, what, what were the big ones? There's like the car one. What's the uh, Volkswagen and all these companies that come out of supposedly a defeated thing, but clearly there is some people of power there somehow that, you know, got to keep all their shit and well, that, that have become giant world controlling companies instead of militaries, you know? And now you got Simon's Volkswagen, 
Microsoft, Google. I mean, they're not all German. I'll just expand that out. But we're being run by these companies and we don't even seem to have any recourse on them anymore. And there's mm -hmm. not just a king whose head we can go cut off to fix it every couple hundred years when it gets real bad. We're just sort of stuck in this system with a faceless emperor. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, after the Second World War, all the uh, all the German, all the Nazis who went and worked in America, you know, for the uh, for the rocket the space program and so on. And, uh, and uh, no, it was it was it was a, a transition, a smooth transition under the guise of being a, a great victory against fascism. But they just had to sort of uh, work on uh, rebranding it in some way and representing it to the public to later over you know over the course of the subsequent decades such as through the wf you know which is um, one of the more obvious continuations of the nazi project in my mind and the i mean the european union even mm, yeah yeah i what i realized when when i was reading your book um the with way there is is how new the global state is. like we are only in a very the infancy of the world being controlled by states now it's it didn't feel like organic it felt like artificially now the world has become governments where it wasn't too long ago where there wasn't you know there was a bunch of different societies and tribes and there wasn't necessarily this this state that was mm. that is now all of a sudden everywhere for the first time ever really so it really kind of clicked in my head like this is kind of new territory as soon as we became globally connected uh maybe it was world war one that really forced that upon the globe but somehow the lines have been drawn now like never before and we're kind of stuck no matter where we are in some state yeah with um that's very true and it's we we've also we assume that that's that's normal that's that's the trouble for me is that people just you know that just oh yeah people think it's always been like that oh well, always, there's always been the state there's always been the government no, there hasn't yeah. just people you know living in villages and uh, <laughs> existing and uh, having you know having lives human lives and in the same way as all the um, all the other creatures on the on the earth live their lives without somebody claiming to be their um, their boss or their ruler or um, you know, demanding taxes from them and uh, pushing them around and making them pay rent for birds birds aren't asked to pay rent for living in their nests you know and, uh, so somehow we as a, as a as a you know supposedly superior species have fallen the mo most part of us have fallen to a lower state than, than, than the animals in the world because apart from the domesticated or farmed animals, maybe the wild animals in the world, because because we don't even have the the freedom to just to live where we want and lead our lives independently. So how do, how does that fit into your sort of view of anarchy, um, or what you were saying is uh, what was your other word for it there that you used? Um, the organic, organic radical organic radicalism like property what would property rights and pr how would property fit into that property is one of those um it's one of those areas i like to um think about over the, the last few years because i like the word capitalism I've, I've sort of used property to mean landed property which deprives ordinary people of the, of the right to to live where they want you know, that's, that'll be my, so when anarchists criticize property, that's what they really mean. They mean the, you know, the lord of the manor or the, uh, or the local millionaire who's bought up all the land and people can't go and, uh, you know, can't graze their uh, goats on it or go and collect firewood. And, you know, the enclosures we had in England where they just, there was a lot of common land where people could just go, you know, they could just, it wasn't, didn't belong to anyone. It was, it was, it was just there. And, uh, and they could leave, uh, lead a simple life based on being surrounded by that land. So the property, the sort of property I'm against would be the sort of property where somebody, just because they're rich or powerful, closes off huge parts of the land and says that it's a private forest or a private mountain or whatever. The property of uh, just somebody having a house and a, and a bit of land, which is theirs to use and other people can't come and trample all over it and come and take things from it. And, uh, it's, it's it's fine from my from my point of view it's you know yeah it's yeah a, yeah it's a bulwark against uh, tyranny to be able yeah to and it feels like it's a natural uh inclination for us to want to to make our own sanctuary or home you know like 
Of course. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's well, yeah, you could, listen, if you go and try and fucking, you could look at wolves, you could look at tagged polar bear maps, you could see very clear, distinct boundary lines. And if another pack of wolves or another bear goes in there, there's going to be a fight. And so, you know, that I would argue that those, those bits of private property, uh, to an area you can defend, you know, I, well, I mean, I'm using defend just as a loosely, I don't mean defend, but you know, maybe you got your, your 20 acres or your hundred acres or whatever you can sort of see, you know, what it just, so it's not getting out of control, but I would argue that that exists and, you know, in tons of different nature. Yeah, on just that small level, you know, it's like, you know, birds have little territories, everything sort of has its little territory and it bumps into each other. So I'd say that, you know, to a certain extent, us humans are, are meant to have our own little bit of territory. It just shouldn't be out of control. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's the way, that's the way tr people have always traditionally lived anyway. So you can't really, uh, I don't think you can argue with that. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> but we haven't, you know, it's the last thing we've got now is, uh, when they're, where they're pushing us in completely the other direction, where they want to uh, herd us into uh, smart cities where we've, uh, you know, we haven't got the right to walk out of the front door without a, a high social credit score and a QR code on the smartphone to, uh, you know, so we're going completely in the wrong direction of everything that we, that we really want in my mind. Yeah. Is there um, a way of marrying the two? Because I agree with you. So to start with, I agree with you, but at the same time, I can't help but think at the, how much more freedom I do have in my life because of some of this crap, you know, like I don't have to be stuck at the office 60 hours a week to get done, you know, where my grandfather, you know, he's stuck in that office all day, every day. Whereas now I'm able to do a lot of my work mobily maybe from home, um, I'm able to do this show, you know, the different things where we're able to monetize and, and reach people that we haven't been able to reach before, but at the same time, it's our undoing in the background. Do you see a way to sort of marry those two? Well, you know, what you're saying about working is right, that it's uh, obviously advantageous not to have to go to an office. But I would say, why do we have to, why do we, why do we ever get into that situation of having to go and work for somebody else, you know, 60 hours a week or whatever it is, uh, just in order to have money, which is the means that in our society that you have to have in order to live. You know, we've, we're sort of twice removed from just being able to live and having access to, 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 to food and shelter and the rest of it. And then we have to go through this, this this process of working for the people that own everything in order to get their little tokens, to, you know, a whole whole of your lives to get little tokens just to do the things that you really you should be able to do anyway. I mean, uh, are we are we? Is the human species just so useless that it couldn't it couldn't survive like all other animals survive? And 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 and, and, and with with the also with the the intelligence and innovation to, to to be slightly above that level to have a sort of culture and. It's like you know, it's like human style sophistication rather than just uh, just like living like a you know a sheep or a deer or something. But um, so I that would be the question. I think that yes, there's a double edged sword with technology, and that it obviously I'm talking to you here now thanks to it. But when you strip it all away, if if, if you started off from scratch, is it overall a good thing? And I, my my argument is no, it's not. <laughs> So, so that's where we get into the anti-industrialism. Like you've, I love that post that you had about that. It, it created a bunch of conversations and comments about it, but you've got sort of like the seven reasons why you're anti-industrial. So how would you define industrial then? Because of course this, this sort of invites the conversation that, well, like where, how far back do you have to go before in technology or any kind of sort of like thing becomes industrial? Like, is it, when you start making product and stuff for for beyond your sort of like immediate uh, tribe I know what or I would small say. group, or it would be as soon as you're supporting people that can't take care of themselves. Because <laughs> I mean, that's that really 
the to, I wanted to mention on Paul's point is because he was like, I think there is a bunch of people that can't do that. I think that we're at such a point in the world right now where there is a large measurable percentage of people that, that couldn't just cut it on, if you gave them a hundred acres, they're just going to be dead when you go back in a couple or, you know, like, and I don't know if that, so you, like we've industrialized to the point where we've domesticated ourselves to like, we're this mm -hmm. homo sapien domesticus that can't probably hack it in the wild anymore. So I was wondering what you thought about that. Like, do you think, that that all these people could if you just threw them on their own you're like hey man can you get some deer get some you know figure it out like no, but they, but they, gonna be they, can't, they can't even be productive within the industrial society i mean this is the, the not even in the non-industrial society but they can't even they're 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 only consuming even even in this society so they can't produce even but they are the product of the industrial society so if it weren't yeah, exactly. the industrialization there's an argument that they wouldn't exist yeah, you know, they're a product of industrial society, but I mean, I'm, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm setting out a long-term vision. I'm not saying, I mean, it's, it's not practical, and we're not going to exit from industrialism tomorrow morning. You know, it's, 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 it's I'm thinking of a, a what, what I'd like to do is to help start up a conversation about where we're going with industrialism. That is it, basically, is to say because we're not at the moment. You're not really supposed to challenge it. It's seen as very, very fringe view and uh even slightly stupid and ridiculous you know just, well, how can you say that you know you're and you're also hypocritical because i'm speaking here on a via a computer and the rest of it but that's not that's not that's not the point it's a philo philosophical point it's, it's looking ahead for the next you know hundreds of years of human existence and saying can we really keep on going further and further down this industrial path because you do have to keep going further and further that's the other sad thing because it's all dependent on economic growth and you know return on investment and increasing profits that's why they have to keep inventing new machines to replace people and why they've now got possibly got a surplus of people because they don't need this they don't need all those workers anymore it's it's always going to keep on encroaching further and further and, and growing further and further and it's like a cancer really so um because uh, it would be quite nice if you could stop it at a certain convenient point like oh well it wasn't too bad in uh, you know in the 1920s or something or whatever or, the, or in the 1980s or, i don't know whatever we, we perhaps all got an idea of what is an acceptable level of industrialism which is coming back to your point graham and uh i wouldn't i know uh, you know I, I quite like medieval society from a from a from a long way off i've never lived there <laughs> i'd quite like to go and uh, visit it sometime but uh no, it doesn't seem to be possible, but um, but you know, but it's not really a question of what I what I think is acceptable, or what you think is acceptable. It's that it's that we can decide together what to balance up the pros and cons of, of industrialism, which is not done. It's just taken as a grant for granted that it, we have to have progress. We have to have more and more of that if we're capable of inventing something and producing it. Then we have to do it. Well, no, you you know, I like that that traditional idea of uh, of looking at the next seven generations and how it's going to affect them, because that's going uh, way into the future. Yeah, and I, mean, uh, I I would think staying somewhat local with your production and everything would be a a, a spot to even aim for. You know, like mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. you know stop selling it around the world. Uh, let's keep it sort of local and self sustainable in a way, and see how that that works out. But I mean, they were talking, but reading some of these old books from the 1800s and 1900s realize how much like the the global trade was already sort of happening and how much it seemed to be uh driving so much like and i guess that is probably what you're 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 also talking about with industry like it really happened a lot sooner than i thought where they were you know they they wanted to import and export uh in britain from all over the world there was that that seemed to be the main focus like we have to get these goods cheaper and we have to supply these goods to france and germany and like it seemed to be a huge driving force and now we're, we're now we're stuck in this sort of uh globalist globalist sort of cycle um where was i going to go with that with the uh the self-perpetuating uh yeah there, there seems to be there has to be a spot where there's like a sweet spot where you can stop and, and stop growing just for the sake of growing, you know? Um, yeah. That's kind of where spirituality comes into it because we're missing that, the meaning we're missing the purpose and, in 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 in, uh, in the young, the young people are just sort of waffling around with no meaning. Um, 
I don't know where I'm going with that either, but um, maybe one yeah, of you guys can help me. To me, it goes hand in hand with uh, with the industrial world is that people are, are reorientated towards um, making money or having to work and wanting material possessions and uh, to sort of adapting themselves to whatever society requires of them. Looking inside yourself is, is becomes difficult because um, it's not encouraged and you're judged on the surface rather than on the interior. And um, so I think there's always this increasing, every generation has this sort of alienation faced with the reality of the, uh, of the society they founded. With my particular generation, this, this manifested itself in sort of punk and things like that. And, you know, I sort of just smash it all up attitude which is yeah not particularly helpful really in the long run but but it was a reaction against this lack of meaning in the world i think it was a search it was a, a search for something else that outside of the what we can all sense i think a lot of us can sense there's something sterile and shallow and empty about modern life and um and we're, so we're looking for something else and what we're, you know, what we're missing possibly, probably, I think, is a sense of spiritual connection to uh, to each other, to nature, to the cosmos as a whole. And uh, yeah, so that's where the spirituality side of it comes in, fits in with that bigger picture. Yeah. Have you have you studied any of the uh, the the secret societies? Uh, in are you are you in France or the UK? Yeah. You're in France. France. Have, have, I was just reading this, just finished narr I, I Sorry to all the listeners when I bring this up, but I, I narrate these older books. And this book was from uh, Abbey Beruel, I think, from the late 1700s. Um, it was uh, called The Code of the Illuminati. So it was about the Bavarian Illuminati and how their whole structure was set up and how eventually it leads to uh, how how it affected the French Revolution, I guess. And 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 – in prep for this, for talking to you, I, I want to read a couple of things from this code because it's really interesting how th there seems to be a, there was a real pushback against it, of course, when people found out about that these guys wanted to get rid of government and religion and they wanted to sort of reshape the world, it seemed, from their own writings. I mean, they're really fascinating. So again, a lot of it would, it would be like, I kind of like, I'm thinking, why was that so, so bad? Uh, it seems like they wanted, you know, getting back to liberty and, and there's, there's some major things wrong with it, but um, they want to get back to liberty and equality, which is interesting. So from the code, from the code, it says, why should human nature be bereft of its most perfect attribute, that of governing itself? Okay. That's, you know, why are those persons to be always led who are capable of conducting themselves? Is it then impossible for mankind or at least the greater part to come to their majority? And then there's another another one there. So it says this is from the initiation to a priest. So it's like one of the higher ups in, in the secret society. And this is apparently from their own documents. So it says, do you think the present state of nations corresponds with the object for which man was placed upon the earth? So, for example, do governments, civil associations or religion attain the ends for which they were designed? Do the sciences to which men apply furnish them with the real lights? Are they conducive as they ought to be to real happiness? Are they not, on the contrary, the offspring of numberless wants and the unnatural state in which men live? Are they not the crude inventions of crazy brains or of geniuses laboriously subtle? So they're, they're talking about like getting back to like they're, they want to dis dissolve like governments, um, the, the religions as well, and get back to like this this natural state of freedom, but in an anarchist way without property. So it's, it's really interesting how they, they throw all this, this verbiage in their, in their whole uh, protocol. And yet they're very atheistic and they, so there's a huge like disparity between like what we would be sort of wanting. Right. Um, and, and no property. So that's where, well, it's just it's just weird to see the people like even the author of this book pushing back saying how crazy this sounds. And yet we've already lost complete trust in in all the institutions, pretty much, you know, including religion and government and everything. So for me, that part is like, well, it's a no brainer. But I guess 
maybe there was a sweet spot back then in the late 1700s before the French Revolution where some people sort of appreciated the state or religion a little bit more. Have you thought about that or have you come across any of that in your research? I've not really read about um, the Illuminati and uh, no, I know, I know a bit about them, but not much. Um, I was, there are a lot of ideas that get, um, you go back to the origins of it and it seems okay. You know, you, you get the impression that they're saying the right things, but then you, at some point you realize that they've, they've, either, they've taken a wrong turn or they've been hijacked, they've been used and you don't know, it's impossible. Even when you're living in the same time of history, it's impossible to know whether people are deliberately leading leading you astray or whether they're being led astray by someone else you know I'm, I'm thinking of the sort of you know the fake left that are currently misleading people um but look for example there was um i don't know if you know much about the english revolution when the when the uh charles the, the first uh, charles king charles was uh, beheaded in uh in 1649 i think Anyway, in the middle of the 17th century. And uh, I'm, I've, I've always been really inspired by some of the radical groups who were involved in that revolution, like the uh, the diggers particularly, who went up and dug the common lands to, 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 to have the freedom to feed themselves and the rest of it. Um, but they, they even saw at the time that the, the whole, this, this revolution to which they'd given their support and a lot of, of genuinely radical, freedom-loving people had given their support, had in fact been hijacked and used by a, a clique around Cromwell and the city of London, which really just had wanted to get rid of the old monarchy who were blocking <laughs> the advance of, uh, you know, of capitalism, basically. Uh, so, but they realized that in their, you know, in their lifetime that they'd been, they'd been, they'd been had. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's an, that's an awesome story. Get, carry on. Yeah. So this, I mean, this just happens throughout history. I think that, yeah, yeah, which seems to be sort of part of the French Revolution too. Like apparently these guys were interspersed um, all over Europe and and using the Masonic lodges as well, and they sort of uh, perpetuated the French Revolution. I mean, it's it's pretty clear that they wanted sort of a global domination, an atheistic sort of global domination. Um, just I I just don't know like how you know how far they got and how far if it's still sort of perpetu. It seems to be almost like uh, the the prior manifestation or, or the, the, the WEF kind of thing, the whole thing that's going on right now seems to be a, a similar manifestation to, to what they were trying to do then. But now you've got technology and the way that the world is connected where in the late 1700s, I'm sure that, um, you know, it wasn't that connected yet. Um, but uh, what else was I going to say about that? The, the uh, just the co-option. Yeah. That's fascinating how they, they can, the, the, the other warnings of the, the book I read about the crowd, the behavior of crowds uh, from uh, uh, Emerson, what's his name? What's, his, uh, what's the author's name? It was written in the early 1900s and they were warning against this too. Like it's so fascinating to see that they knew how crowds reacted back then and that there was always the risk when you overthrow the dominant, uh, the dominant uh, uh, person in, in charge, like the, the dominant tyranny. That, that the risk is you become just as bad or, or worse than they were, it seems. Or unprepared. Or unprepared. Yeah, or you're just being used as a pawn by a, by a rival ruler who might turn out to be just as bad or even worse than the original one. So. Right. Well, before we run out of time in the free show and go into the member section, I got to ask because my favorite in uh, uh, de industrialist, of course, was, uh, I mean, and I'm not. I'm not saying condoning what he did, but the the famous one, of course, is Ted Kaczynski and uh, his book, uh, The Industrial Society and Its Future. Have you read it? I assume you've read it? Yeah, yeah. What did you think? I mean, it's so prescient. It's kind of crazy.